Hey y'all, Dixie here. Today it is time for another Silly Questions video. About once a year or so, I'll put a question out on social media asking people, hey, do you have any questions about backpacking that maybe you've been a little timid to ask before? Or maybe it's a question that I wouldn't typically cover in a full-on video, but I can do a medley type video where I answer all sorts of questions on different topics. Now, this is more aimed at beginners, but some of you longtime hikers still might have a thing or two to learn. So if you wanna check out the video description, I have timestamps there for the different questions. And there will also be a list of links to all of the previous Silly Questions video. Let's get started. The first question is, what about shorts versus yoga pants for women? This one is a little tough because it's definitely going to be a personal preference thing as is with most clothing and honestly most backpacking gear in general. But what I can do is say what I prefer and why in specific instances. Most of the time, if I'm going to be hiking in the late spring, summertime, and early fall, I like to hike in shorts. The reason I prefer shorts in the warmer months is because they help keep me cooler. The downside to shorts is they don't protect your legs as well as leggings will against things like rocks or thorns and also bugs like ticks. Now we'll tell you that mosquitoes will jab right through those leggings and suck your blood anyway. Also, I've had less chafing in leggings than in shorts. I don't know something about the material of my shorts. If it's way too humid or way too dry, then I'll get some irritation where the hem part of the shorts kind of rubs my thighs. But after some time, that ends up working itself out, which is why I've stuck with the shorts. Now, if it's cold, I'm gonna be wearing leggings. I'm a very cold natured person. So basically anytime early spring and before or mid fall and after, I'm probably gonna be in leggings. The biggest downside to leggings, other than they can be too warm sometimes in my opinion, is if you get a pair that starts getting kind of stretched out or sometimes even with a new pair, if they don't grab enough, then you'll have this thing where they kind of shimmy down while you're walking and it starts feeling like a saggy diaper back there and you gotta try to pull them up. So you wanna make sure you get a good pair that are gonna stay up so you're not plagued with having to pull them up all the time or let your butt crack hang out. The next question is how old is too old to through hike the Appalachian Trail. I don't know if y'all have heard of him, but there is a man by the name of Nimblewell Nomad who set the record for the oldest person to through hike the AT last year, and he was 83 years old when he completed his hike. Several years back, there was a lady by the name of Dragonfly who was 74 years old when she completed her through hike of the AT. And then as many of us are aware, Grandma Gatewood was the first woman to solo through hike the Appalachian Trail at the age of 67, which at that time made her the oldest person to complete a through hike of the AT. So all of that to say, it, it really just depends on the individual. I can't speak for your physical shape or your health. But I do think as people age in the backpacking community, it should be more of a priority to train before beginning a through hike as it makes sense that that would increase your success rate and specifically to practice with carrying weight on your back. But if you decide last minute that you want to go out and through hike the AT this year and you don't have weeks or months to prepare and physically train, then there's nothing wrong with getting out there and giving it a try. The wonderful thing about a through hike is when you take your first couple steps on the trail, there's not this magical door that closes behind you and says, you can't turn around and come back home. Now you have to make it to the end. So get out there and give it a go and, and take it slow, listen to your body. And if you need to leave the trail and come back and do more the next hike in season, then that's okay. But I have seen all kinds of shapes and sizes and different backgrounds of people who got out there and were successful with their through hikes of the AT. For example, there was a lady that I through hiked with and she was 71 years old when she completed the trail. Her name was Bluebird. And there were days when I would be in a treacherous part of the trail and I knew that Bluebird was several days ahead of me. And I'm like, if Bluebird did this, then I can do this. But there were people much younger than Bluebird who were not successful at completing their through hike of the Appalachian Trail. So I say get out there and go for it. If you're interested, there is a group that's a spinoff of the Homemade Wanderlust Backpacking Forum group on Facebook. 
and it's hikers that are 55 plus. So I'm gonna put a link to that group in the video description if you wanna join there and talk with some people who are in the age range of 55 plus about their specific concerns and tips for backpacking. And next up is if you break down your food into freezer Ziploc bags, do you just toss those when you get to the next town or do you rinse and reuse? There are some people who actually pour boiling water into freezer Ziploc bags and rehydrate in there and eat their meals out of that. So if you do that, I would just toss them. But if all you had in there was some freeze dried food or dehydrated food, then I wouldn't have a problem with just saving those until I got to town, rinsing them out there, letting them dry and reusing them again. And I definitely have done that because I didn't want to purchase new Ziploc bags every time I went to town and also to reduce the amount of plastic that I'm using. Just make sure that if you do rinse and reuse that the bags are completely dry before you put any more food in there because you don't want it to get damp and then mold and get funky while it's in that Ziploc bag. On a through hike, if you go into town for a resupply, but you don't want to get a hotel for the night, what do you do about washing up? Do you just find a public restroom and do the best you can in a sink, or is there another option? Well, there actually are some other options. First, depending on where you're at, there may be community centers that allow you to shower for a donation or a certain fee, and I've even found churches that reach out to the hikers and allow things like that. And then sometimes there are hostels that even if you're not getting a room for the night, they'll allow you to pay $5 or so for a shower. And if you wanna do laundry, that might also be an option. And then there are trail angels. So you can always reach out depending on what trail you're through hiking. There may be a trail angel group specifically on Facebook for that trail. Sometimes towns will have a list of trail angels, so you could always hit up one of the trail angels and say, hey, is there a way that you would allow me to come and take a shower? A lot of times, if there is a list of trail angels, they'll have things that they'll offer next to their name, like rides, lodging, etc. But worst case, yes, you can definitely find a public restroom and do the best you can to clean up until you hit the next town. But make sure if you do that, that you don't leave the bathroom a mess. You get any mud or grit up that you deposit into the sink. On the same note of hygiene, the next question is, how often do you wash up on trail? This person says that they typically do the armpits and the tail once a day, but as far as everything else goes, do you just wait until you get to the next town stop? And this is gonna be a personal thing. Everyone will be different. I know that there are people that don't worry about washing anything at all until they get to town. But for myself, I prefer to do the same thing, the armpits, the nether regions. And I like to rinse my feet if I can once a day, whether that's finding a cool source to soak them in or even at camp if I've got some extra water that I can wash my feet off with. But baby wipes are a godsend in my opinion for doing a sponge bath on trail. And so when I find myself going number two in the woods, that's usually the time that I'll go on and give everything down there a good cleaning. Basically, I try to attend daily to the areas that could be problematic if they get too funky. Do people pack bathing suits with them while backpacking or through hiking, or do they just go swimming in their hiking clothes, their undergarments, or in nothing? I think all of these have happened at some point. I'm sure that there is somebody who has gone backpacking and taken a bathing suit with them. But I would say for the most part, from what I've seen on my through hikes, most hikers do not carry any kind of bathing suit. They'll just get out in the water in their hiker clothes, especially if those need a good washing too. I personally prefer to go in my hiking shorts and my sports bra. In a sports bra, you're not seeing more than you would in a bathing suit anyway, but there are certainly people who will just go in nothing. And especially if you get to a hot springs area, it seems a lot of those can be clothing optional. But even in towns, when I've stayed at a hotel that has a pool or a hot tub, a lot of them do say bathing suits only, but they know the hiker community is coming through and 
that we probably don't have bathing suits and I've never had anybody complain if I'm sitting in a hot tub in my hiking shorts and a sports bra. But I guess I kind of just lied because <laughs> at the end of the Florida Trail, I did for a short period of time carry a bathing suit because when I got to the beach down there for that last stretch, I knew I was going to be at the beach and I just, I wanted to have a bathing suit to wear at the Southern Terminus if I wanted to. So when we hit the beach, I did pick up a bathing suit and carry it for the last little bit of trail. But aside from that, I probably will never carry a bathing suit again. Where do you go pee? or otherwise in the desert or other open areas. So this one can be a little tricky. I learned when I was in the desert and in other areas above treeline to try my best to find something to squat behind, whether that was a rock or a bush. But more times than not, it seemed to work better if I went to a very open area where I could see for a long ways. I wasn't in a dip or anything like that. That way, if I did see somebody coming way far in the distance, then yeah, they might see me squatted down and they might have a clue of what I'm doing, but they wouldn't be able to see any details if you know I couldn't really make out any details on them. I have also squatted behind my pack and my umbrella, trying to do the best I can to cover up. Or if you're with other hikers, then you can always ask them to hike ahead and not turn around. I remember specifically my group doing that in the Sierra when you could see for what seemed like forever, just snow all around. I saw on this particular question that somebody else suggested a rain poncho. I can imagine in the desert how that could be really hot and make you sticky and miserable, but maybe above tree line or in other areas that could be a feasible option. Also, I'd be afraid that I'd go to the bathroom on it. And finally, if you're just going pee and you're a female, then using something like a female urinary device like the Shiwi might work well for you because then you don't have to expose the whole moon. Next, there was a question concerning going to the bathroom. This person says they know how to do the bathroom thing when backpacking, but they rarely go as far from the trail as they're supposed to because they're worried about getting lost when coming back. So the question is, are there any tips for making sure you don't get lost trying to look for the trail again when you get done going to the bathroom. First, it's a good idea if you know you're ever gonna backtrack, and even in general when you're walking down the trail just in case you need to backtrack, to turn around and look behind you every so often because it can be very disorienting if you're looking this way, looking this way, and suddenly you turn around. Even though you came from that direction, it just looks completely different when you're looking in the opposite direction. So identifying any trees, rocks, features from where you came from should help you be able to find your way back. Also, you should carry your cell phone with you. That way, if you get lost and you happen to have a little bit of service, you can call for help. But if you're using something like the Far Out app or All Trails that has the GPS capability, even when you're in airplane mode, then that can help navigate you back to the trail. Some people like to take their whole pack with them when they go to the restroom because that way if they get lost they have everything but when I hike in a group I typically leave my pack by the trail that way we all have an awareness of where the other is so if one of my hiking partners was to pass me then they would see hey Dixie's packs right there so now she's behind me she went to the bathroom. Also it's definitely a great idea if you have a personal locator beacon or something like an in-reach to carry that with you if you were to get in trouble, whether that's being bitten by a snake or getting turned around. But it's always a good idea to keep those right with you. And finally, somebody suggested getting something like flagging that's bright colored that you can just tear strips off and tie them onto a limb or bushes and then untie them as you come back and collect them again. And they even make little clips that serve the same purpose and are reflective, which would also be helpful in the dark. The next question asks about hiking as a diabetic who needs to have insulin on hand and needing a CPAP with electrical power on hand. Now, I actually answered the question about CPAPs in a previous Silly Questions video, and as I mentioned, that will be linked in the video description. But as far as hiking with diabetes and needing insulin, this has been discussed in the Homemade Wanderlust Backpacking Forum group on Facebook, and it seems the consensus amongst members who are diabetic is using something like the Frio pouch. You activate its cooling magical powers by soaking it in water and then it keeps your medications cool even if you need 
something other than insulin kept cool. And it can be reactivated time and time again by just recharging it in water. If you're diabetic and you have other suggestions, please put those in the comments below because there are definitely a lot of folks who would love to go backpacking, but this is kind of one of those things that makes them hesitate. And for dealing with sharps on trail, I covered that in another Silly Questions video and that will be linked below also. When you hike with your pup, do you filter their water or just let them drink out of puddles or does it depend? When I go with Fancy May, I prefer for her to drink filtered water because dogs can get Giardia just like people can. Now, if we approach a water source that's flowing and she takes a little lap here and there, I'm not gonna fuss at her for it, but most of the time she stays well watered. If I'm thirsty and I take a sip, then I figure she's probably thirsty too. So I keep a little Kentucky Fried Chicken sides container in my hip belt pocket. It's easily accessible and it doesn't allow her to over chug because it's not a good idea for a dog to get out on trail and just chug a bunch of water. So when she approaches a water source, I try to prevent her from being in that state of mind because it can cause stomach issues. And if they get something like their stomach twisted up, it can cause death. So I just try to make sure that she gets a little bit of water frequently instead of a lot. Now, one thing that I do stress over when it comes to water sources is stagnant water. If we find a pond or even a lake, I've just heard horror stories of people allowing their dogs to swim in these bodies of water and then they end up with some sort of poisoning from the algae in the water and they go downhill quickly. I never want to be in that situation. So just make sure the water is flowing. My wife can't backpack and I feel guilty going on longer through hikes. She supports my passions. What can I do to support her while I'm away? This is a really sweet and thoughtful question. First of all, I think that it's always good if somebody's showing you kindness to reciprocate. So in the future, if she has plans to maybe go on a girl's trip or do whatever her thing is, then definitely encouraging that. And, and particularly if she can go do something like that and stay busy while you're away, then that would be great. But some other things you can do for the duration of your through hike is send her postcards from different town stops and resupplies. It doesn't take but just a minute to write a sweet message. You can get some stamps to carry with you from the post office and a lot of these different businesses will send your outgoing mail. And then she feels like, you know, she can kind of follow you along the way. One of my friends, Dibs, pressed flowers that he would find on the ground in a book and then he mailed a love letter with pressed flowers to his girlfriend at different points along the trail. And I think little things like this can mean so much because it's showing that even though you're out there living your dream, you're still thinking of her. You can do little things like order her delivery one night. If she's talking about like, man, I don't feel like cooking tonight, you know, we'll say don't and I've got a surprise for you in a minute, you know, and you order her some delivery food or send her flowers occasionally if she likes that kind of thing. And another idea that I feel like is kind of a home run for a dude to do for a chick is to send her a coordinate bracelet of where y'all first met or a place that is special to y'all. There are different companies that do this online. They will specifically pick the coordinates that you prefer. And with some of them, you can even put a little message on the back part of the little piece that has the coordinates. But I don't know, if anybody else has ideas about this, please leave them in the comments. As a plus size woman, I'm scared of getting into too intense of trips too fast because everyone I wanna go with is in much better shape than I am. But I'm also scared of going by myself for safety. How would I go about finding hikes, trips that are good for the most beginners of us? How do I keep myself safe on those more frequented trails that I have found that are easier? Do you deal with anxiety over safety when alone or know others that do? How do they slash you deal with it? So first things first, I just want to say that to be a backpacker, you don't have to do multi-day trips. You don't even have to do more than a mile if you want to. So to officially be a backpacker, you put everything that you need in your pack, walk a mile, stay the night and come back. And I mean, I guess it could even be a half a mile or a quarter of a mile, but I'm just saying it doesn't have to be a big long distance. Now I have a couple videos that talk about easing into backpacking. Some of them even go from the perspective of slowly acquiring your gear as you do, but they also deal with the, the fear and the anxiety of being alone, but they'll take you 
step by step from sitting at home on the couch to a full on multi day backpacking trip. So I will link those in the video description below so you can get more details from that. Uh, as far as finding people to go with though, I kind of want to focus on that for this video. I actually had a patron from Patreon ask me almost this exact set of questions not long ago and I suggested to her to check out her local backpacking group and she's like I did but they do way more miles than I'm capable of doing at this time and I feel that because I slowly ease into making bigger miles when I start a through hike I'm not somebody who can bust out the gate going 12 miles per day I just can't do it so I suggested to her to reach out to the local group and most places have a local backpacking group even if it's not 10 minutes down the road it might be an hour away at the biggest city near you but have them make a post or organize hikers that can only do whatever you can do if that's five miles or less if that's three miles per day then see if there's interest in doing one of those more slow paced trips for people who aren't able to do those higher mile trips and i think that there probably are people who would be interested in something like that even if it's not physical limitation i think there are people who would find interest in that because they enjoy the camping side of it more and the socializing side. But a local backpacking group that you could find through Google, Facebook, etc. would have knowledge of the easiest trails in the area to do these trips and probably more information about safety on those specific trails. The next question says, this is so dumb and embarrassing, but it seems that in some areas of the AT or PCT, there would be a lot of people digging cat holes in the same area. How do you avoid digging into a used area? I think I would just die. Oh, yes, the art of finding buried treasure. <laughs> I have definitely dug up a used area before. What I would say is when you get the urge to go use a bathroom, look around and the first place you think is a good spot to go, I promise you, you are not the only person who has thought that that was a great spot to go. So maybe try to find like the third or fourth great spot to go and that'll help your odds of not finding buried treasure. Also, a lot of hikers have the decency of putting something like an X with sticks over the top of where they went to the bathroom or if somebody has stirred their duty in the hole to help it break down, they'll leave that stick sticking in the ground when they bury it. So it's like, you know, I claim this land. But other than that, you just kind of have to take your chances on this one. Are there any hikers here that are hard of hearing and wears hearing aids? I'm hard of hearing and I wear aids in both. Dixie, during any of your through hikes, did you come across any hard of hearing deaf folks on trail? I love hiking and enjoy it tremendously. However, I only day hike. I would love to do an overnight backpacking trip, but I do wonder about safety when I would go to sleep at night since hearing aids are not made to be left in the ears overnight. In the future, I love to hike the AT, but I wonder if being hard of hearing would hold me back due to the safety aspects. Any related feedback would be helpful. Thanks and happy trails. So because I don't have any personal experience with this, I asked the masses on Facebook and there were a lot of comments in response to my post. It seems that there have definitely been people who get out and through hike that are hard of hearing or deaf. There was a fella that through hiked the Florida Trail that used to wear a cap that said deaf hiker so that people would know right out of the gate and I thought that was a great idea. Also another aspect that I considered might be tough is if you're hiking slower on trail and you can't hear somebody come up behind you that wants to pass you for them they're like why is this person not getting over and especially if they're trying to talk and you can't hear them so in that instance if you're deaf or hard of hearing enough that you wouldn't hear that person you might want to put a little sign on your pack that says hard of hearing deaf you know tap me on the back to go around but there's also a fella that i heard about named mr perfect who is currently on his third through hike of the Appalachian Trail and he has been deaf apparently since he was two years old. Now this is all secondhand information, but I asked if he had any social media so that maybe people who wanna learn more about this could follow him and I was told he does not. But if any of y'all know of people who have been hard of hearing or deaf uh, that 
are posting on social media or have shared their experiences at all and you can link that in the comments, I think that that would definitely be helpful for people. Also, somebody gave the tip of an app called Transcribe. So if you're having a difficult time communicating with somebody, say a hitchhiking situation and the person is wearing a mask and normally you'd be able to read lips to some extent but now you can't then using that transcribe app can be helpful but as far as taking your hearing aids out at night yes that would concern me safety wise i like to be able to hear my surroundings at night but if you're on a trail like the appalachian trail that is well populated and you let people know that are camping nearby you that you're hard of hearing you're going to be removing your hearing aids i could see where that could cause some hesitation to let people know that, but I mean, you're gonna be talking to other hikers nearby and you're gonna be getting to know people out there. So at some point when you feel comfortable divulging that information with them, and it can also be a good thing because letting them know if there's a situation like a bear in camp and everyone's hollering and packing up to go somewhere else, you know, come shake my tent or alert me somehow and let me know. But some people actually wear earplugs at night so that they cannot hear their surroundings because they don't want to hear their neighbor snoring or a grasshopper that sounds like a grizzly bear creeping through the leaves. So I don't think that taking your hearing aids out at night would be a deal breaker for the trail experience. Several people commented on my post and said that they prefer to leave their hearing aids in at night and they'll take a break from them in the morning hours just because they don't want to do without them at night. Another thing to think about if you have hearing aids out on trail is if they're not waterproof, how you're going to protect them if it rains. Some people say with light rain, they can wear a wide brimmed hat and that helps protect them enough. But I assume if it's an all out downpour, then the best thing you can do is put them in a waterproof case or a Ziploc bag. Another concern apparently is backup batteries. It would seem like a good idea to have a backup set of batteries with you on trail. And then additional batteries, you can use a bounce box to bounce them ahead for yourself where you can replace them at different resupply points. There were several comments about how taking a dog with you on trail if you're hard of hearing or deaf could be helpful and I definitely agree because if there's something to be alerted about in the night a dog will most likely let you know especially if it's a service dog and that's their job or if somebody's trying to pass you on trail a normal dog will probably be wagging their tail or growling or whatever because they see another person and a service dog that that's one of their duties, uh, we'll also let you know. Dogs that are not service dogs are allowed in most areas on the Appalachian Trail, with the exception being Smoky Mountain National Park and Baxter State Park in Maine. I would assume that service dogs are allowed along the entire Appalachian Trail, but that's something that you would definitely want to check on. But just know that taking a dog on a backpacking trip, let alone a through hike is something that should definitely be well researched and not last minute and not all dogs do well with backpacking and especially through hiking if you want to read the rest of the comments that were left on that post that i made on facebook i will also link to that in the video description all right y'all well that is all i have for you today i want to say thank you so much to everybody who was brave enough to submit a question i know it can be intimidating especially when you feel like I should probably already know this answer, but here's my question. If you're watching and you have a question that you kind of feel like this about, don't be afraid to drop it in the comments because I can either reply to it and help you or somebody else in the community can, or I might even use it in another Silly Questions video down the line. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go, and we will see y'all next time.